this is you, right? Looks good. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everyone. Um, you've covered my first slide. So yeah, I've been thinking about uh, big data systems since 96 when we started working on the search engine. So this is kind of a talk where I try to take some of the patterns we've seen in past iterations and look forward. So last summit, um, I talked about why I thought Apache Spark was the most exciting thing happening in big data uh, in the day. And really, the two takeaways were the potential of Spark to be the lingua franca for, big, for data science, and the fact that I saw Spark and Hadoop as just incredibly complementary. So how are we doing against that? Well, Spark is now bundled with every major distribution of Hadoop, and it's also being bundled with a lot of other interesting uh, environment, big data environments. And Spark is in use for data science. You're going to hear a lot of um, talks in the summit about people's success with data science and Spark, and you're going to see you know, some of the new tools that are being developed to support data science on top of Spark. Very exciting. So great progress. So is it time to declare victory? Clearly not. There's just, we're just getting started on the uh, Spark journey. One of the things that I've seen with new technologies is that you know you're making progress when people stop telling you, you this is exciting, you've got great potential, and start filing bugs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're at the bug stage, right? We're huh. really getting real traction in enterprise, having impact. And that means that there's lots of opportunity to make it better. We're learning. And so this is a talk to the Spark uh, community where I sort of talk about some of the patterns I've seen and some of the things that I think we can you know, add to just reinforce the success that we're seeing. So first off, you know, ETL is an area of increased focus for the Spark community already. This is not news to anybody. Right? Science needs the data. And uh, the data needs to be in the right place and in the right format. Um, one of the things that we're seeing which is exciting is people taking the Hadoop ETL languages and bringing them to Spark. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, better job scheduling tools are needed. You've already heard mention of a couple of people doing research projects on that. Um, ETL workloads are different from these analytic workloads that Spark was born with. So, you know, the community is going to have to continue focusing on scale and throughput. The great news is Spark 1.0 represents a big step forward against those goals. Right? We're now hearing about 1,000 node Spark clusters and pet petabyte scale uh, Spark jobs. Right? That's a big step forward. Um, but the thing I think we need to do now as a community is really focus on building benchmarks and iterating. All right? There's nothing like sort of being able to demonstrate your progress um, every quarter. So I think that that's something that I would really encourage the Spark community to do. Um, more stuff uh, to support data science. R bindings, obviously there's a huge amount of excitement about R. There's some research work that's been going on and some early products that are really you know, bringing R into the Spark toolkit. I think we'll see more of that. That's very exciting. Uh, I'm talking very fast because A, I'm between you and lunch, and B, I think a lot of my points have been made by other speakers, so I'll try to keep us on schedule. Um, let's see. So we need to add more features to ease and accelerate code sharing. If Spark is going to be the lingua franca for data science, that means it's got to be really easy to take your buddy's code and run it on your cluster. So I think there's opportunities to enhance the Spark language itself, taking the best ideas out of other languages that have become great code sharing languages, such as R and Python, uh, Ruby, Perl, et cetera. Um, Spark SQL uh, needs to be run against more data stores, including object stores, right? So we're seeing um, the Cassandra guys contributing a driver that lets us take their, their data and use it natively in Spark. But we need to take Spark SQL and make it work against all those operational stores. And we've got to think about stores that don't present their data as uh, tables with schemas, but present their uh, stores as collections of objects. Right? How are we going to mesh that with SQL? I think there's some interesting work to do there. Um, another thing that I'm hearing a lot of when I asked sort of Spark users, uh, what were the three things you'd want to tell the Spark community about what to work on over the next year. Deep learning and other sort of algorithm support were something I heard a lot about. Right? There's a trade-off between completeness of your job and speed. Maybe I am okay with 
executing 95% of my query and just dropping 5% every iteration if I can close those computations faster. And there's a need for more communication primitives to support things like deep learning where you have these subclusters of nodes talking to each other during the computation. And there's always a need for more developer basics, more profiling, more debugging, error reporting, logging, et cetera. So, you know, there's no sleep for the Spark developer. Um, so then let's talk a little bit about uh, the history of Hadoop at Yahoo. All right, so at Yahoo back in, nine, in 2006, we decided to invest in uh, Hadoop as a technology. At the time, it ran on 1020 nodes and was kind of slow. And we wanted to make it uh, good enough to do our web search uh, indexing of the web on, right? So petabyte scale jobs. So that was going to take a few years. So one thing we did kind of as a, just to sort of to show management that we were adding some value was setting up some research clusters where Yahoo's data scientists could take data coming from web search, you know, web pages, users' queries, things like that, and come up with interesting data results. We thought when we did that that this would, like I said, produce some good valuable um, data insights, maybe trained models that could be used for um, advertising, um, ad targeting for users, or maybe um, you know, just other insights in the data. What we didn't expect and what happened very quickly is the science teams came back and said, yes, Hadoop is helping us. Not only are we getting data results, but here is an application that we have written on top of Hadoop that we want your help running every 15 minutes in production. If we do that, we're going to drive you know, Yahoo's revenue up 1% this quarter. That was a bit of a surprise. So we very quickly found ourselves in the business of running Hadoop as a service, and that got adopted quickly across Yahoo. That's why you see this number of machines run in production ramping up to 40,000 computers um, and hundreds of petabytes of data in Hadoop. So that was uh, you know, a, a real virtuous circle that got established where people did data science on Hadoop. That led people to build data applications on Hadoop, that, and putting those in production drove value. Uh, for the company, which led to more such projects. So this is kind of the pattern that you see a lot. Uh, this is an, an example from Yahoo, which, which is the front page personalization. Every time a user visits Yahoo's homepage, Hadoop is not uh, contacted. There's a serving system that looks a bit like you know, Apache web servers and something like Cassandra talking to each other to provide the web page. But when it renders that page for you, what, one of the things it's looking up in that operational data store is what are this person's interests. If this person has expressed an interest in sports or cars or cats, right? everybody's different. So every user just has this sort of vector of things that Yahoo has decided they're interested in. And it uses that to decide what articles to show you, what ads to show you, et cetera. Um, so, and this drove user engagement. Yahoo got Users clicked twice as many links when they deployed this kind of machine learn based user personalization. So what you see, and this pattern repeats itself in application over application, is this kind of three layer system where you have the web servers, could be Apache, AppLogic, Tomcat, stateless things, the sort of classic um, web server design talking to a classic data store. It could be a NoSQL database like Cassandra, it could be MySQL, Oracle Rack, but an operational data store. That's what I call the interactive layer. So that is very mechanical. I look something up and I use that to build your web page. And while I do that, you interact with that web page, you click on things, and that sends information down to the analytics um, systems. That goes down through some messaging bus, maybe Kafka. And then there's two paths. There's a streaming path where as soon as I, I want to have dashboarding that shows what's happening in the application immediately. And if, for example, I'm building an advertising system. If you've showed an interest in cars, I want to show you car ads now because you're going to you're doing your research now. Now's when I'm going to have the most value by giving you information about your expressed interests. If I wait a week to show you about cars, you may have, you know, you've lost interest. You've bought a car, you've bought a vacation. What you're, the personalization is much more powerful if it's fast. So that's why you see this streaming engine that's willing to take shortcut, shortcuts to get the uh, model of your interests updated 
by the time you click again on Yahoo, so very fast. Um, and then you have a batch system that takes all the information about everything you've done over a, maybe 15 minutes, maybe a month. There's usually actually two layers of that. Um, and does a much more elaborate machine learned job of figuring out all the things you might be interested in based on all the activities you've taken on the site. So that's this batch layer. So you put this together and you have kind of a classic big data application. This should look familiar because it was mentioned in a couple of other talks. So where are we in Spark applications today? First off, we're seeing lots, an ecosystem of third party products um, evolving already in Spark, and you're gonna hear a lot about that in the summit in the next couple of days. Very exciting. Um, a lot of these are data products, and some of these are tools to build data products. Um, so if you look at the sort of classes of applications being built on Spark today, you see a lot of these custom in, uh, solutions, internal applications inside companies. So that could be things like personalization. Yahoo, I believe, is actually using Spark for personalization today. Um, but I used that personalization as an example, but this is the same thing in ad serving, this is the same thing in you know, sort of financial applications, marketing applications, retail gaming, the intelligence community, healthcare, everybody is using the same pattern. Um, they're both the sophisticated sort of first tier players are building internal apps to do this. Then you're also seeing products being uh, built to allow sort of enterprise data tooling improved ETL and two improved BI and queries. Um, again, the sort of dashboard product would be a sort of classic example of this pattern. Um, and then data science tooling, analytics and ML, collaboration and reporting, and the verticals that I just enumerated. So why so much activity on Spark? So Spark speed allows really compelling interactivity. So you can tighten up those loops. As I said, there's more value if you can deliver that insight quickly, all right? Um, the interactive API is really ease development, all right? If you look at a, you know, the integration of SQL query with big data, it's historically been a challenge because the people who developed the uh, SQL query tools that work over those ODBC, JDBC drivers, assume that the database will come back in sort of user interactive time. You have to really rethink the whole application if the query is gonna take five minutes and the user is gonna wander away from the dashboard or probably submit another query because he's waiting, tired of waiting and thinks it's broken. So it's much easier to develop an app if the API is, is interactive. Uh, Spark has that property. And then it's running well in many environments. It's running in the cloud, it's running on Hadoop, it's running against Cassandra now, um, and we're seeing this sort of broad open uh, source community support which sort of reinforces this open, um, this virtuous cycle. The more people are using Spark and talking about Spark, the more people try using Spark. So um, this is why we're seeing a lot of Spark applications. So what can we do to make Spark better at supporting those applications? Um, one is, of course, build an open certification suite. This is a lesson that, you know, learned from the Hadoop experience. I'm very excited about this open certification suite. Um, what are the goals? Well, for an application writer, you want to be certified because you want to be able to write your application once and run it in all those different environments. And not only you know, run it on the cloud, run it on every version of Hadoop, run it on Cassandra as well, but also as those systems evolve, you don't want to have to republish your app. This is where a lot of pain has been experienced in the sort of big data ecosystems, right? You want to write your app once, not have to re-release it every time every vendor does a patch. Uh, so certification promises to make that better. So being proactive about that is very excited. Um, the user developer community also values, um, gets a lot of value from this because they can contribute to the certification suite and make sure that their use cases are covered. Right? This, um, again, makes sure that the suite gets better and makes the whole platform better for developers. And then finally, the open source community itself has a tool to make sure it does the right thing, right? Backwards compatibility has been really hard, right? The other big data 
um, communities don't break backwards compatibility because they want to, they break backwards compatibility because it's hard and they don't have the metrics and tools to identify all the corner cases. Um, so by having this shared open source suite, is, this will keep this requirement of helping people's apps run on Spark as Spark evolves front and center in the developers of Spark's mind. So this open certification suite, this open source certification suite is, I think, just an incredibly valuable initiative for all the members of the Spark community. Very excited about that. Um, then sort of a, a sort of final bucket of ideas is around sort of tachyon and more storage APIs for Spark, right? Um, first and foremost, if you look at tachyon, the goal is sort of better multi-tenancy for Spark. You want to be able to have different users launching different Spark jobs and collaborating on one system with one fixed pool of RAM, right? So being able to keep objects in RAM between jobs and between users is valuable. Um, and having a system-wide view of RAM requirements and being able to optimize in that multi-tenancy environment is obviously very valuable. Um, so that's sort of what Tachyon was begun to do, so was started to do. So it's, it's delivering on that and will continue to evolve to do that job better. Um, as Spark emerges as a cross-platform API, I think there's another mission that uh, needs to be focused on, which is providing a storage portability layer, right? You want to be able to run your, write your job once against, H, against all these different storage backends. Um, and we want to make that transparent to an application. Your application doesn't need to know if it's running against uh, an S3 blob store, or an HDFS file system, a Cassandra object store, right? If we can provide sort of one consistent API, that'll make application writers' jobs much easier. Um, and finally, uh, beyond Tachyon, although involving it, um, I think the Spark community has a real opportunity to work on this sort of emerging opportunity to do um, sort of three-layered tiered storage for big data. How do you decide whether you place your data on physical disk, on SSD, or in RAM? Right? I, there's huge, we've seen huge speed ups by using RAM aggressively with Spark. Um, SSD is becoming much more prevalent um, in the kinds of systems that Spark is running on. Leveraging SSD as well as RAM and physical storage can massively increase the use cases that Spark can address. So that's very exciting. Um, and in that mold in particular, I think one of the things that uh, Michael Franklin alluded to is I think Spark can do a much better job of doing point lookups and helping build those interactive applications by making the data in your RDs much more point addressable. Uh, very excited to see that work coming out of uh, AmpLab. All right, with that, let me just reinforce that, in my opinion, Apache Spark is the most exciting thing happening in big data today as well. There's lots of opportunities to make it better, but I think we've made tremendous progress over this year. So enjoy the show.